All right, um, this is a sample efficient toplitz covariance estimation. Um, it's joint work with Yonina Eldar, who's at Wiseman, Jerry Lee, who's at Microsoft, and Chris Misko, who's in the second row, he's at NYU. So in this work, we're studying the very like classical problem, which is covariance estimation. Um, I have a positive semi-definite matrix T, it's D by D, and it's the covariance matrix of a d-dimensional distribution. So it's basically, I'm drawing d-dimensional vectors from this distribution. The expectation of their outer products, the expectation of x, x transpose, is equal to the covariance matrix, which we're trying to learn from samples of this distribution. Um, another way to think about it is tjk, the jk at entry, is the covariance between the j and k at entries of those vectors. And we're going to get independent samples from this distribution. And then we want to return an approximation to t, which we'll call t tilde, such that there's small distance between them. And in our case, we'll look at distance in the spectral norm. So the spectral norm between t and t tilde, we want to be less than epsilon times the spectral norm of t, where epsilon's an error parameter we'll set. And the sample complexity will depend on epsilon. <coughs> and today, we're looking not at the general problem, but specifically at the problem when we have a really structured covariance matrix, specifically when the matrix is toplets. And so what's a toplets matrix? If, if you don't remember, it's just a matrix that all the diagonals are all the same as each other. So the, the on diagonal is all equal to one entry. If you're one away from the diagonal, these are all equal to the same thing. So it's a very structured matrix. It's parameterized by, instead of d squared parameters, it's parameterized by d parameters. OK, and this might seem like a really maybe artificial. Like, this is a really structured matrix. Why do we care about this? Estimating toplets covariance matrices comes up a lot in signal processing applications. So basically, it comes up when the covariance, when you're taking points, when you're taking samples and the covariance between them depends on the distance between them. So an example in a signal processing application is you have some signal coming in. You're reading it at discrete points. If you read two points that are next to each other, these are very highly correlated. If it's a smooth signal, the signal doesn't change much between these two points. So there's a lot of correlation between those two close by measurements. Um, and Two far away measurements are going to have a lot less correlation. If the, even if it's a smooth signal, if it's far away, the signal can vary a lot. Um, so basically, the covariance between measurement j and k is some function of the distance between j and k. If you, show, if you look at what the covariance matrix looks like, this will lead to toplet structure. So nearby samples are samples that appear near the diagonal of your matrix, and far away samples appear farther away from the, from the diagonal, and the covariance just depends on the distance from the diagonal. And so um, what do I mean by these things are correlated? Usually we're thinking about our signal as maybe a random signal. So really what we're getting is we're getting different samples from this class of random signals. And the expectation of these, the, cover, the, the expectation of uh, x transpose x from these samples is what the covariance matrix is. And usually these samples are maybe not truly independent. Usually you're reading them at different points in time with enough spacing between those different points in time that they look independent. So I have some signal coming in. I'm trying to understand the covariance structure. How do close by points relate to each other? How do far by points relate? I'll read it in different windows of time spaced out. Each of these windows, I read d discrete values. And these windows are far enough that I model it as the signal is independent between these windows. So I'm getting independent samples with this toplets covariance. This is just sort of motivation for why we care about estimating in, this case, in the toplets case. I'm not really going like, to get into how we choose these windows or how we space them or things like that. OK, so there's lots of applications. Uh, one is like spectrum sensing, basically figuring out what frequencies of signals you're receiving so you can adapt to receiving them. Doppler radar, direction of arrival estimation. I'll show you on the next slide an example of this. And then things like prediction via Gaussian process regression or kernel methods. So if you think about it for a second, kernel matrices and machine learning become toplets Co they become toplets covariance matrices when your data points are spaced equally apart. So if your data points are on a grid, a kernel matrix is a toplets matrix. So there's a lot of connections there. Let me give you an example. Oh, sorry. So before I get into the example, there's two types of sample complexity we're going to care about when we're learning toplets covariance matrices. The first is the classic notion of sample complexity, which we're going to call vector sample complexity. This means how many samples do we actually need from our distribution um, in order to estimate, get a good estimate of the covariance matrix T. I call it vector because it's just how many vectors do we need to sample from our d-dimensional distribution. I like the general case. We only need to estimate one row of 
Yeah, so if you could estimate one row of the covariance, then you can estimate the covariance matrix. So there's less parameters in some sense. Um, but we care, we're measuring our error in terms of the spectral norm between the covariance matrix and the, and the estimate. And it's not exactly clear how to map like an approximation of the row to a, to a difference in that spectral norm. But you also know that template matrices have low displacement, right? You, you do know them. that, but yeah, we don't really use it in our algorithms. Um, and I'm not, it's like really, it's used a lot, for example, like working with topless matrices, like computing with them, but I'm not sure how you can use it necessarily to get low sample complexity, but you might be able to, yeah. We don't use it though. Yeah, so vector sample complexity is how many samples we need to take. This is the classic notion of sample complexity. And then the other thing to think about is entry sample complexity, which is basically how many entries do we actually need to read from every vector that we take, okay? So in different applications, these complexities have different trade-offs. All right, these complexities correspond to different costs, and typically there's a trade-off. Typically, if you read less entries per sample, you're going to have to have higher vector sample complexity. And then we'll also talk a little bit about total sample complexity, which is just the total number of entries you need to read of your samples. It's the vector sample complexity times the entry sample complexity. And I think that Entry sample complexity isn't very well studied uh, in covariance matrix estimation. You usually assume you read all the entries. Um, but it seems interesting beyond topless matrices. So yeah, anyway. OK, so why do we care about this entry sample complexity? I'll give you a, sort of a very like, rough sketch of an application, which is direction of arrival estimation. This is, uh, I have an array of, these guys here are receiving signals. I have an array of receivers. And there's some antenna sending out, there's somebody sending out a signal that, these, um, that this array is receiving. And I want to understand where is the signal coming from because it then lets me, for example, like focus in on that signal or distinguish different signals coming from different directions. So this um, sender sends the signal. I, I parameterize its location by the angle that it's sending at. And depending on what that angle is, like this receiver is going to receive the signal a little bit before this receiver, a little bit before this receiver. And so there's going to be some covariance structure between those receivers. And it's going to change when the angle changes. So when the angle becomes steeper, they're going to receive the signal more close at the same, like sort of almost at the same time. And so there's higher covariance. So without getting the details, you can back out this direction of arrival from the covariance structure of the signal that's received at these different signals, at these different antennas. And so what do our two sample complexity notions mean? Vector sample complexity is sort of the number of snapshots of the signal we need to take, which corresponds to sort of uh, estimation time. And then entry sample complexity is the number of entries we actually need to read, which in this setting corresponds to the number of antennas that actually need to be turned on. If, you turn, if you're not reading all the entries of your sample, the entries of your sample correspond to what's read at these different antennas, you can just turn off some of your antennas so you have lower equipment costs. So this is the trade-off between these two sample complexity measures. Yeah? Where's the noise coming from? The noise would be coming from the fact that not all your, um, not all of your, like you're getting random noise sent in from, there might be one strong signal, but you're also getting in various like signals from elsewhere. Um, and maybe cloud Yeah, and also like this is a very simplified example. So typically you would do this when you also have multiple senders. Um, so this, there's just like one sender, but you can have multiple senders too or on the, on the receivers. OK. Yeah, the positions of receivers can change. I just heard someone say that. Like, we're, yeah. Um, OK, so what's the current state? So there's lots of algorithms for estimating Toplitz covariance matrices. But as far as we can tell, there's few formal results on what are these sample complexities um, and what are the trade-offs between them. Our contributions is we're going to give some non-asymptotic sample complexity bounds by analyzing some classic algorithms. And some of our sample complexity bounds are actually going to have sublinear sample complexity. They're going to be based on this classic technique, this kind of cool combinatorial technique called sparse rulers, which I'll talk about. Um, we're going to show that these sparse ruler methods actually give sublinear sample, total sample complexity when your matrix is low rank, which is the case when you're doing this direction of arrival estimation when you have k senders and k is less than your array size d. And then we're going to develop some improved algorithms based on tools that we're more familiar with. So based on, in the low rank setting, based on tools from matrix sketching, leverage score based sampling, and 
um, sparse Fourier transform methods. And these algorithms we develop will resemble some things are, that are used in practice, but they're not exactly the same. Um, the main idea is to sort of understand how these tools can give uh, some theoretical contributions to Toplitz covariance estimation. And the sort of broader agenda of what we're trying to do with this project and just with recent projects is we want to build connections between theoretical computer science and specifically randomized linear algebra and some more of what's going on in signal processing. So there's already a lot of connections there, especially with sparse recovery. So like people in TCS and people in sparse recovery, there's lots of crossover. But we think there's lots of other interesting problems to look at, um, including, for example, Toplitz covariance estimation. So um, we've been seeing connections between things like leverage score sampling and sparse Fourier transforms and things like sub Nyquist sampling, Chebyshev interpolation, active sampling, um, and then also connections between things like column-based matrix approximation and combinatorial sparsification, and things like nonlinear function approximation, Fourier sparse approximation. So I'll get to these a little bit in the talk. And yeah, we have some other work doing this, basically looking at sampling for reconstructing sig like band-limited signals and other things using leverage score type approaches. Okay, so. We're looking, remember, at entry sample complexity and vector sample complexity. Today we're going to consider a simpler form of algorithms, which basically take n samples from our distribution. Um, and then for every sample, they read some fixed subset of entries, which I'm going to denote R. Um, and then I'm going to approximate my, my covariance matrix using just these samples in the subset R. So I have n vectors. I read every one in R locations. My entry sample complexity is the size of this set. And my total sample complexity is R times n. Note that this isn't like the only type of algorithm could, you could consider. You could read different samples. You could read different entries in different samples. But this just, all of our algorithms are going to follow this format. And so the first question to tackle this problem is how small can R be? What is the minimum entry sample complexity to actually estimate the covariance matrix? Okay. Let's first think about not for general covariance matrices, not toplets. Could we actually do sublinear entry sample complexity? The answer is no, by an easy example. Our covariance matrix could be one of two things that we're trying to distinguish. In one case, the covariance matrix could be the identity. All entries are independent of each other. In the other case, um, there's a correlation between two randomly chosen positions, xj and xk. Those are perfectly correlated, so xj is always equal to xk in your samples. So your covariance matrix is the identity plus this off-diagonal block. In order to notice that xj and xk are coordinated, you better read both xj and the entries corresponding to xj and xk. So you have to read at least d entries of your samples. So this shows you that the, si the entry sample complexity for general toplets, or general covariance matrices is at least d. Are there questions on that? Well, that one matrix is positive definite, while the other one is semi-definite, right? So there you're already losing. This would be. Even if this was not like one on the off diagonal, if it was anything, like say it was a half, so it was still a PSD matrix, you would still need to read entry J and K in order to notice that correlation. Um, so yeah, you have entry sample, yeah, same thing. Yeah. Okay, so this is a lower bound for general matrices. How are we gonna get around it in the toplets case? How small can this subset R be that you read? And what we're going to do is we're basically going to take advantage of redundancy in this case. So if you have a toplets matrix, you don't just have one off-diagonal entry, which is equal to some value. You have a lot of redundancy. So for example, this correlation A1, which is the correlation of things that are distance one apart, appears a whole bunch of times in your matrix. If I want an estimate of A1, I could estimate the correlation between x2 and x3. Or I could estimate the correlation between xd and xd minus 1. So I have a lot of options of these different pairs to estimate the correlation between. And what we're going to see is that because of this redundancy, we can actually achieve entry sample complexity, which is equal to square root of d instead of d. Which I don't know, maybe if you, if you see an intuit, I don't know if that's intuitive for people to see why square root of d might come up, but I'll explain it in a second. So how are we going to get square root of d entry sample complexity? We're going to use what's called a sparse ruler or a sparse difference set. This is a subset R of D, of like one through, of the integers one through D, such that for every single distance from zero to D minus one, there exists a pair in, our, in the subset R, such that J minus K has that distance S, okay? So for example, if D is 10, we wanna measure all the distances from zero to nine. 
this would be a sparse ruler. If I look at just positions 1, 2, 5, 8, and 10, you can look at all, if you look at all the pairwise distances between those positions, all distances between 0 and 9 are represented. Okay? And generally speaking, for any d, you can find a sparse ruler with two square root of d entries in it. Um, the construction's pretty simple. I basically put, look at all positions from 1 to square root of d. And then I also look at all the positions spaced out by square root of d. So with these positions, I can measure any, if I want to measure any distance, I basically look at you know, this grid, this coarse grid to get close to the distance, and then I adjust which of these um, close points I use. So for any um, d, you can have a sparse ruler of size 2 square root of d. And actually, this is a sort of like toy, like people play around this problem in combinatorics, like what's the best leading constant? Is it 2? Or, and, and it's somewhere around like 1.6, but people don't know, and there's lots of work on this. But for this talk, we're just going to, and we're carrying up to constant. So we can always get a sparse ruler of size 2 square root of d. OK. And I'll also mention that the optimal rulers don't usually look like this. Usually they look like something like this, where they have more densely measured points near the edges and less densely than measured points near the middle. And hopefully this will come up later in the talk. We saw these ruler constructions. We were like, hmm, that looks a lot like Chebyshev interpolation. Is there some sort of thing going on there? We still don't have a real answer to that, but this is sort of like this vague thing that we think there's some connection, but we don't really know. So anyways, that's sparse rulers. So how do we use sparse rulers to estimate the Toeplitz covariance matrix? If R is a ruler, so if I have some set of entries that all distances are represented, I have at least one pair that has distance S. So I can estimate every entry of my covariance matrix AS by um, the expectation. I can just average sort of the correlation between uh, xk and xl. So I get one independent sample of AS from every single sample I take from my distribution. So if I take enough samples, I know that I'm going to at least converge on an estimate. As my number of samples goes to infinity, I'm going to at least converge on an estimate of t. So I know that I can get this entry sample complexity at least as long as I let my vector sample complexity get really big. So then the question is, what's the trade-off? How many vector samples do we actually need? What do we pay for this optimal entry sample complexity um, that we're getting with sparse rulers? Let me try to give you some intuition about what this trade-off should look like. So let's assume that I have a d-dimensional Gaussian. It's distributed with a, a Toeplitz covariance matrix, and the on-diagonal entry is equal to 1. So the variance of every entry is 1. If I take something like log d over <laughs> epsilon squared samples, then for every pointwise estimate of my covariance, I'm going to get it to some error, which is less than epsilon. Note that all of my covariances are bounded by 1, because my on-diagonal entry is bounded by 1 in this matrix PSD. So I'm going to get everything to additive error at most epsilon. So my approximation to my Toeplitz covariance matrix T tilde basically looks like the true covariance matrix plus these epsilons. The difference is this matrix of all these epsilons, OK? Now, in the worst case, if these epsilons were correlated with each other, um, the spectral norm of this matrix might be as large as epsilon times d. But if they were independent, using like some random matrix theory, th this is proven specifically for Toeplitz matrices, um, if they were independent plus minus epsilons, then the spectral norm would be epsilon times square root of d. Okay? So what would I do is I could set a new error parameter, epsilon prime, which is epsilon over square root of d. Um, and my total sample complexity would go from being like roughly what, from log d over epsilon squared to uh, log d over epsilon prime squared, which is d over epsilon squared. So this gives me a vector sample complexity bound. And, and I get this sort of relative error approximation I want. Are there questions about that intuition? How does this compare with uh, the general? Yeah, so good question. I think I have it on the next slide. But this, would, this matches what you would get in the general case except you're now using entry sample complexity square root of d rather than entry sample complexity d. And this works only for the particular triplets matrices that come from the direction of a Riemann problem, right? I no, no, this works in general. I was just using that as a sort of motivation, but this works for any, to, any to, Toeplitz covariance matrix. So all we need is that it's positive semi-definite. Covariance. 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 So, so really we're using that as positive semi-definite. Yeah. OK. Um, OK, so the, the key assumption that was, is clearly incorrect here is that I said all these things are independent. They're not even independent if this was the true empirical covariance matrix. 
In our case, we're measuring them all with this very sparse ruler. There's lots of correlations between them. So the difficulty is basically in understanding this independence assumption. But what we show is that for any ruler, um, if we do this estimation procedure, that the intuition that they're independent actually just holds and it gives you sort of the right bound. So for any ruler, we get this error, uh, epsilon error, and the vector sample, the entry sample complexity is the size of the ruler, and the vector sample complexity is d over epsilon squared. So matching what you get for general covariance estimation, um, but doing much better in terms of entry sample complexity. And the proof of this uses basically the Fourier structure of Toplitz matrices. I'll sketch it super quickly, but I'm not going to go through it in detail. Let me just explain to you exactly what the algorithm is. Um, for every distance from 0 to d minus 1, basically for every value that we have in the Toplitz matrix, we're going to approximate the distance by averaging over the ruler. So we're going to sum over um, all the samples. Then we're going to sum over all pairs in the ruler that have that distance. Um, xk times xl. So this is the empirical covariance where I just average over the samples that I have. And rs here is just the set of all distance. It's the set of all um, pairs in the ruler that have distance s. Okay. And then we're just going to set t tilde to be the covariance matrix where we put uh, a tilde s on its s diagonal. Let e denote the difference between the two co true covariance and our approximation. Um, uh, little e will just denote like if I vectorize this Toplitz matrix, so I just look at uh, the entries on the diagonal rather than the matrix itself. We basically want to bound the spectral norm of our error. Um, and how we're going to do this is basically we need to understand how does entry-wise approximation to our matrix let us bound spectral norm. And we can do this via the Fourier transform of this vector e. Um, if you've seen this before, you'll know it. And if not, I think it's a really cool tool. It took us a while to learn about this because we just didn't know these tools. I take E, which is a Toplitz matrix. This is the error between my estimate and the true Toplitz matrix. You can extend that out to an infinite matrix where you just like extend the diagonals and we put all the other diagonals to zero. This infinite Toplitz matrix is diagonalized by the Fourier transform. So this, this just, no matter what E looks like, this is always true. So now I've written this infinite Toplitz matrix as Fourier transform times diagonal matrix times Fourier transform. The spectral norm of my error is bounded by the spectral norm of this infinite extension, because my error is a submatrix of it, which is bounded by the spectral norm of this thing on the right, which is easy to um, compute because it's just the maximum of this diagonal matrix, because the Fourier transform is unitary. So basically, we've reduced bounding our spectral norm to bounding the maximum of whatever this Fourier transform looks like. Um, and this is the part that I'm going to sort of sweep under the rug. But you can basically understand this Fourier transform in terms of some traces involving um, your samples and a measurement matrix. So we're going to reformulate bounding the maximum of this Fourier transform as a, as a trace bound and apply like a standard matrix concentration bound. We specifically apply Hansen right. So I'm going to sweep the details under the rug, but I'm going to show you what the result is because we'll use it later. It's, yeah, it's double, the infinite matrix, and I know that I have the improper terminology for these types of things. I just think of everything as a matrix, but it's infinite. It's indexed by all the integers on the rows and all the integers on the columns. Sure, no, it's a real number, so it would be something I call it a Laurent operator. And the Fourier the four op operator is infinite, and the inter it's indexed by the integers and the rows and the, actually the, the real numbers from 0 to 1 in the columns. Other questions about that? The details don't matter a ton, I guess. But let me just tell you what the result is. So if I take 1 over epsilon squared samples, then with high probability, this max is bounded by epsilon times two norms. The first norm is the, the spectral norm of TR. TR is the, just the principal submatrix of um, the Toplitz matrix corresponding to the ruler that I measured. And then the, the Frobenius norm of this matrix M, which we call, I'm calling the measurement matrix. M is a Toplitz matrix. And the entries of M are basically the number of measurements I made of each diagonal. So MJK is the number of measurements I made of distance J minus K. We call this sort of the, the measurement matrix or the coverage matrix, because the more measurements I make, the smaller the entries in M are. 
I can bound this quantity by epsilon times the spectral norm of my full toplets matrix, because TR is just a submatrix of it. And then the Frobenius norm of M, you can see that every entry is at most one. It's Frobenius norms at most square root of D. So I can bound this by epsilon times my spectral norm times square root of D. So if I have one over epsilon squared samples, my error is epsilon times spectral norm times square root of D. I again set epsilon prime to epsilon over square root of D, and I get this D over epsilon squared bound for vector sample complexity, which recovers what I would have gotten in this independent, this sort of false independent case that we were getting intuition from. And as I said, this measurement matrix basically gives us a sense that the more coverage the ruler has, so the larger the, the number of measurements we make of every distance is on average, the smaller this Frobenius norm is, the smaller our error will be. Uh, it's not, no, and it's, uh, yeah, it's not positive semi-definite. Um, that's a good question. Like one, a good question would be, can we get like a similar recovery guarantee where our matrix is required to be positive and semi-definite? I, yeah, I don't know, actually, I don't remember if you can easily convert from positive, I don't remember if you can easily convert or not, actually. I think you can't, but I, I, I yeah. You could always add, right? yeah, so, oh, so you could do that. So you could always, if you get error epsilon times uh, spectral norm of T, you could always add on the diagonal epsilon times spectral norm of T would be PSD, and the distance would now be two. So you're right. So you could convert, yeah. Okay, so, um, but the nice thing about this measurement matrix is it lets us interpolate between the minimum entry sample complexity of like a sparse ruler and minimum vector sample complexity where you're gonna actually read more entries. So as an example, this R bound holds for all rulers. One ruler is you just take the full subset from one to D. So there's like D squared distances in this. In this case, you can show that the coverage or the Frobenius norm of this measurement matrix is like a logarithmic factor. So what our bound gives in the full, the full case is that we need to take one over epsilon squared vector samples to get an approximation to our matrix. And even this was not known as far as I can tell before our work, even though it's sort of intuitive. In the general case, you have to take D, D um, samples. In the toplets case, there's less parameters. It turns out you only need to take roughly one sample, one over epsilon squared. And the algorithm that we actually use is not quite the algorithm of, of just estimating T by its empirical covariance. What the algorithm reduces to is you have your true covariance, you compute an empirical covariance, and then you average the diagonals to get a toplets matrix. And this gives you your improved estimator. This is the one for which the bound holds. It's intuitive that this should be much better, and it actually does hold that it's a much better estimate than the empirical covariance. Um, yeah, yeah. OK. So let's look at the difference between sparse ruler methods and full ruler methods the to in total sample complexity. So for the sparse ruler methods, we paid root d in our total sample complexity. We paid d in our vector sample complexity. We had something like d to the 3 halves total sample complexity. For full ruler method, we pay d in our, vector, in our entry sample complexity, read the whole vectors. But we only take order one samples, so we actually have better total sample complexity. And this is really true. We like simulated, um, we basically simulated our, our algorithm on a hard case. The hard case is actually the identity matrix. And in this case, taking um, full samples, your total sample complexity, um, it's this line here, it's linear in D. And then the algorithm where you use a sparse ruler, total sample complexity is a lot worse. It's like D to the three halves. That's when your topless matrix is the identity. And you can prove that the bounds are tight. But in reality, for matrices that you seem to see in applications, you don't get this behavior. You actually get the opposite thing. So here, um, this is if I'm doing full samples of my vectors, and this is if I'm doing sparse ruler samples, and I'm plotting the total sample complexity. I actually get a lot lower total sample complexity using the sparse ruler methods. And the question is, why is this? Um, this is just a picture between intuitively a, a high rank toplets matrix. This happens on low rank toplets matrices, this phenomenon where the sparse rulers do better. Intuitively, a high rank toplets matrix looks sort of like an identity. A low rank toplets matrix you can think of as sort of like a more spread out identity. So for low rank matrices, if the rank is like a very low, like something fixed like four or something like this, we're observing that the total sample complexity is root D for sparse rulers and D for this full estimation. So we wanted to explain this. And we can do this using the same bound that we have. So we showed that after one over epsilon squared samples, 
our error was bounded by the product of these two norms, the spectral norm of TR, the sum matrix corresponding to the ruler, and of this measurement matrix. And the critical thing that we were loose on is we said that the, the spectral norm of TR was just less than the spectral norm of T. But TR is a small submatrix of our original matrix T. So we should expect its spectral norm to be smaller. But by how much? If our original matrix was the identity, the spectral norm of the full matrix versus the spectral norm of the matrix we actually measured, uh, they're equal to each other. And this is why the identity is the hard case for sparse ruler methods. Um, but the identity is a very full rank matrix that has no decay of its eigenvalues. And we can use the fact that low rank matrices just don't look like the identity. Um, they have to have significant off diagonal mass. If you have a low rank matrix and all the diagonals are one, then it has to have significant off diagonal mass. Uh, David Woodruff, Christopher, and I proved this in a totally unrelated result like a couple months before this paper. I don't know if it exists in the literature in general, but it's a really useful property um, that basically a low rank matrix with, uh, that has an identity on its diagonal has to throw a lot of mass off the diagonal. So what does this mean is that when I take a sub matrix of this matrix, I'm going to lose a lot of that mass, and I'm actually going to get a much smaller spectral norm. The upshot is that I can prove that if my sub matrix is size root d, and my original matrix was rank k, its spectral norm is at most k over root d times the spectral norm, norm of the full matrix. Um, this lets us improve our entry sample complexity because it improves our error bound. OK, so that's the approach using sparse rulers. Are there any questions about that? Yeah? Well, you have a symmetric triplet matrix, so that's a, 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 a circular matrix. So when you extend that into an infinite matrix, then you move your FFT. So you're diagonalizing the circular matrix, right? So a symmetric matrix is not necessarily circulant. Circulant requires that it's like wraps. Circulant would require that it sort of wraps around. Um, and the difference is that a, well, I'll explain in a minute the difference between circulant and topolent when I get to a slide, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. No worries. OK, so that was the sparse ruler methods. Um, the remainder of this talk, I have about 10 minutes, I'm going to sketch a different approach, basically to estimating low rank toplitz matrices using techniques basically from sparse Fourier transforms and from leverage square sampling, which is sort of what we had been working on a lot. And these techniques are going to use the Fourier perspective. I'll tell you in a second how it relates to the circular matrices. Um, something called the Vandermond decomposition. Again, I think if you're in applied math, you probably know what this is. If you're in theoretical computer science, you, I had never seen it before, at least. This is that. Any rank k toplets matrix um, can be written at, it can always be diagonalized by a Fourier transform in some sense. The toplets matrix can be written as the product of a frequency matrix, where basically this is a d by k matrix. The columns think about as k frequencies. They're not necessarily on grid frequencies, just any k frequencies, times a diagonal times that frequency matrix transpose. Any toplets matrix can be written in this way. If it was circulant, these would be on grid frequencies. And it would make the problem easier. But they're, in general, they're just off-grid frequencies. Any sample that has covariance matrix, let's say we're taking samples from a Gaussian that has um, covariance equal to our toplets matrix. These samples can always be written as like t to the 1 half times g, where g is just a standard Gaussian. So these samples can be written as uh, this frequency matrix f times d to the 1 half times g, where g is just a normal Gaussian. Um, and you'll see that they're distributed with toplets covariance. But the important thing is that the samples can be written as um, f times d to the 1 half times g. That means that the samples we're getting from our covariance matrix are sparse Fourier functions. So x is just a combination of these different frequencies in our Vandermond decomposition, where they're combined with the weights given in d times some random Gaussian weights. So every sample we get from our covariance is actually a sparse Fourier function. And then we can start thinking, wait, we can, should be able to recover this with few samples. And if our toplets matrix is exactly low rank, just to like check intuition, we could exactly recover this with Prony's sparse Fourier transform. So if we read 2K entries of this, then we could exactly recover it. Yeah, yeah, that would be the next slide. Okay. This is just to check. This is just your intuition behind if it's exactly low rank, then this is why you should expect that maybe you can do something. So there's tons of work on robust sparse. I mean, all the work on sparse Fourier transforms. Prony's been known for a long time. Like all, the work on, all the work on sparse Fourier transforms in order to make this robust, essentially. So we'll get there. That's, that's coming.
hopefully in five minutes. <coughs> so, okay, but that, that's, just pl that's just pretend Peroni's method works for a minute, okay? Let's suspend disbelief. So we take one over epsilon squared samples, we recover each exactly by reading 2K entries using Peroni's method. And then we apply our earlier result for full vector sample complexity. We knew if we took full vector samples, we needed like one over epsilon squared um, samples. So our total sample complexity, uh, we're only reading K entries per sample, it becomes K over epsilon squared. Okay? That's if Peroni's method works. Okay, but what about when T is close to but not exactly low rank? And by not, I mean like, even like, Peroni's will only work if you're basically like exponentially close to lower rank. So it won't work in general. Peroni's method totally fails. It's not robust to noise. So there's going to be two steps here. Step one is that we're going to prove that when T is close to low rank, then it doesn't have a Vandermon decomposition that only has K frequencies. But what we're going to show is that there's some set of K frequencies that approximately span every sample from our covariance. This might sound obvious. Like if it was low rank, there would be K frequencies that, that span every sample. We just want to hold that, show that this is more robust fact. It's not as easy as it sounds. At least it wasn't as easy for us as it sounds. I'll talk a little bit about how we proved it. Step two is we're going to use some sort of robust sparse Fourier transform method to actually approximately recover our samples. And then what we're going to do is once we recover these samples, we're going to estimate T from these samples. Sparse Fourier transforms are like well-studied in TCS and beyond, um, they're mostly in the case when your frequencies are on the grid. So in this case, this would be like when um, your matrix is circulant. What we're going to have to use in this case is an off-grid sparse Fourier transfer method when your frequencies can be anywhere, because in the topless decomposition, they can be anywhere. OK, so first step, prove that when t is close to a rank, there's actually some set of frequencies that approximately span each of our samples. And we're going to do this via a column subset selection result. People that know randomized linear algebra know these types of results. One example is this gurishwami sanop result, which is basically for any matrix, um, there's a subset of k over epsilon columns of that matrix. This is any matrix, no assumptions, such that if I project a to the span of those columns, I get within 1 plus epsilon error of the best rank k approximation to that matrix. Where is this going to come up in our setting? our samples are being drawn with covariance matrix T. So we can write these samples as basically T to the 1 half times G, where G is standard Gaussian, which means we can write them as F D to the 1 half G, where F is this Fourier matrix, D is the weight on the frequencies, and G is standard Gaussian. So what does this look like? Our sample matrix, we take N samples, each of them has D entries in it, is written as frequency matrix times diagonal matrix times a standard Gaussian. We think of G as being a linear sketch. So in randomized numerical linear algebra, what we would often do is take this matrix here, and we'd sketch it with the random Gaussian. In this case, this has been done for us by the covariance process. So we think about G as being a random sketch. And formally, what we show is that it gives what's called a projection cost-preserving sketch of the topless matrix. What this means, this was something that we introduced a few years ago. It just means that if I find a low rank approximation for the sketch, then I get a low rank approximation for the original matrix, and vice versa. So what we do is we apply a column subset selection to the original matrix, to F times D1 half. This is T1 half. We find some set of frequencies that actually well approximate this matrix that in their span is a good approximation. And then we back this out and say, this actually does a good approximation to the sketch, which means in the span of these frequencies, we get a good approximation to our actual samples, X1 through Xn. Um, meaning we can write our samples approximately as some set of frequencies times some recombination matrix. So what I've proved is sort of what might have been intuitive, that if, I'm, if the matrix is close to low rank, every, you can recover your samples as sort of um, spar approximately sparse Fourier functions. You can write them in a span of a few frequencies. <clears throat> so then the question is, how do you recover these frequencies um, and then uh, estimate t using this approximation? Some people might get angry at me for this. I'm going to use, we're going to find these frequencies by brute force searching over the net. This is an exponential time algorithm. The reason for this is twofold. We were focused in this paper on sample complexity. We weren't worrying so much about runtime. 
There are methods for doing off-grid sparse Fourier transform, but you usually have to make some assumptions, like on separation between the frequencies and things like this. And we wanted no assumptions. So our algorithm is going to hold with no assumptions. And so for this, we're going to pay this exponential runtime. So also those, those off-grid Fourier algorithms do assume that you're sampling in a way that's quite different from how you've collected your samples. Like you've assumed that you've collected them on a regular grid. Yes. And um, the off-grid Fourier, or certainly the fast, the fast off-grid Fourier things assume that you have quite a bit of um, freedom. Yeah, to, that's right, to sort of sample. choose where these samples go. Yeah. So that's another point. They're actually, yeah, that's a good point. And yeah, I mean, one goal is eventually to try to adapt these. I kind of think they should be adaptable, but it's, yeah, anyway, so we're gonna run, we're gonna just be brute force search of this. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, we've collected them in a grid, so it's not clear you can apply just to any of these algorithms. Right, so the, so the, yeah. the, Sampling methods assume assume that you've that you've collected data on a on a regular grid, but but with random spacing, and so you have okay. you have different you know different, okay. different randomly spaced grids, but they are regular. Okay. So it's I sort see. of similar, but not. But quite. not exactly. Okay, I see. Okay, so we're gonna brute force search over this net, and at each step of the search, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have some candidate set of frequencies. We're going to try to reconstruct our samples within the span of these frequencies. So we're going to try to find some reconstruction matrix to write my samples in this span. Um, but how are we going to do this without reading all of our, all of our samples? This is where leverage square sampling is going to come in. So what we want to do is we want to find a recombination matrix that approximates my samples x in the span of these frequencies I'm trying out, fm. This is just a regression problem. I could do it easily. Except that I don't want to read all of my samples because I'm trying to get low entry sample complexity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sample my uh, matrix uh, X, my sample matrix, by leverage scores of this matrix F, which I'm doing the regression. Sampling by the leverage scores will give me an approximate regression solution. Um, I'll just remark that if these were on-grid frequencies, um, the leverage scores would be uniform. This would be very easy to do. This is like one way of seeing why you would get essentially RIP for subsampled Fourier matrix. But what we want to do is sample by the leverage scores of these off-grid frequency matrix. I'm out of time, so let me just say that um, what you can do is show we need to sample by the leverage scores of many of these off-grid frequency matrices at once. What you can actually do is give closed form upper bounds on these leverage scores that don't depend on the frequencies that are in your matrix. So we're trying to solve a regression problem to recombine some frequencies to get some vectors. No matter what those frequencies are, as long as there's k of them, you can give an upper bound on the leverage scores. The leverage score upper bound looks sort of like this. For things near the edge of your interval, so for your, like, um, yeah, for things near the edge of your interval, the leverage scores are large and they dip down. Again, it sort of looks like what you would do in polynomial interpolation with Chebyshev nodes. So you get this closed form upper bound on the leverage scores. And since this distribution is universal, we sample by it once. We solve all the regression problems in this brute force search. And then we find our good frequency based low rank approximation. So the final algorithm is we sample like poly k over epsilon indices according to this, the leverage scores of these, these Fourier leverage scores. <clears throat> For every frequency in our net, we compute an approximate projection. We approximately reconstruct our samples in the span of those frequencies. We find the best approximation to our samples, and then we just estimate our toplets matrix with that best approximation. So that's the full algorithm. Um, you get sublinear sample complexity. I'm out of time, so I won't go into the details on that. Let me just really quickly mention open directions and, and questions. So one thing is runtime efficiency. Can we get these sparse Fourier transfer methods to actually work in our setting? Um, you should be able to avoid exponential runtime um, complexity, but it, it's not an easy problem, I don't think. Another thing is to improve sample complexity. So our, in the end, our sample complexity is something like k squared for a rank k matrix. It could be better. Uh, for four rank matrices, we get square root of d. It could conceivably be square root of k. And so we're working on this right now, and we maybe have some directions. Oh, yeah. So Chen price k. They get something like k. They get they get suboptimal sample complexity for sparse Fourier transform. So our question: we have two directions to get better sample complexity. One is improve the sample complexity of off-grid sparse Fourier transform. But two is to use things like ours our is a special case, so we can use things like sparse ruler methods to possibly even go beyond it, possibly without even improving their methods. And then I wanted to just 
mention connections between these sampling schemes, these sort of eerie connections that we don't understand. These are these leverage scores that we actually sample by. This is what these optimal sparse rulers tend to look like. And these are the degree 40 Chebyshev nodes. To us, they look sort of similar. You're always concentrating mass near the edge of your interval. And we feel like there's some sort of deeper connection there. There's some formal connections, like the limiting density of the Chebyshev nodes is the leverage for distribution for polynomials, which are related to k-sparse Fourier functions. Another weird connection, if you sample via these Fourier leverage scores, you actually get a sparse ruler with good probability. But beyond that, we know that there's some connections, but we don't really know anything formal. So a big question here is, what's the connection between all these methods that seem to sort of be floating around each other? Um, and Chris will talk about this a lot more tomorrow, is sort of how can we find connections between these methods. So that's it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks.